now, which is entitled The Tudor Party Before and After the Revolution. Um, I am going to uh, introduce our presenters and uh, each have about 20, 25 minutes. We have three presenters and then we have ample time for questions and answers. Uh, our first presenter is Professor Paimon Rahabzadeh. The title of whose presentation is Disowning the Past, a Micro History on the Communique of the People's Fedai Guerrillas regarding the Today Party. Uh, Professor Wahab Zadeh is at the Department of Sociology, University of Victoria, of course, the author of several important volumes on uh, various topics related to the history of the Iranian left and a pioneering one on the history of uh, the People's Fedai Guerrillas. And uh, I will pass this to Professor Wahab Zadeh. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Matin Askeri, Afshin John, for the uh, introduction. And I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I am on the unceded territories of, of uh, the uh, Coast Salish and the Stray Salish peoples. Uh, and uh, I'm here as a settler, as an uninvited guest. And I would also like to thank the organizers of this committee, Sian Moshirang. Me and Thomas Halverson, who helped uh, uh, throughout the co co conference setting everything up, uh, and also for inviting me. So thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I am presenting, uh, uh, you know, as the last panel uh, after four days of really interesting papers. This is a unique conference. I learned a lot, and it shows us basically that how much work there is that we can do about the history of the Iranian left and in fact modern Iranian historiography uh, in, uh, in, the, in general. Okay so um, uh, my, uh, the papers so far presented they have been trying to address major events and turning points uh, shed light on uh, various aspects of the long and complex history of the to the party. Uh, what I do in my paper actually is uh, I'm interested in speaking of a small event uh, or a footprint, you know, in a Deleuzian manner. And, and uh, in this paper, uh, if it emerges uh, as a published paper, there'll be, there'll be more of a discourse analysis within a particular historical context. But for this presentation, uh, the objective is to put simply to use a micro historical event and explore the role of rhetoric in political positioning and in building political discourse, or in short, what, you know, Ernesto Lacla would say, the rhetorical foundation of politics in this particular case. Uh, here, though, because, uh, we, you know, we, it's important to acknowledge the uh, historical context, I'm going to focus on the historical circumstances and what happened and just make some, some intimation, some suggestions about um, the way the analytical component of the paper, you know, in the published form will work. So I'm going to offer a close double reading, uh, you know, as, as a political statement and as a literary text of one of People's Fadai Gorillas or PFG, key and most extensive communiques regarding one of their operations. This operation is the assassination of a key security informant and a former member of the Tudeh party of Iran. That the assassinated man stood in this peculiar junction, a trusted Tudeh member and a trusted Savak informant, having caused significant damage to the post to the leftist activists through numerous entrapments is unique in and by itself. The communique is titled The Revolutionary Execution of Abbas Shahriari, the man with a thousand faces, greatest spy and key advisor to Iran's intelligence service, 
by the organization of People's Fadai Gorillas and a rejoinder to the message of the remnants of the two party leaders. It's dated March uh, 1975. Uh, just the description of the material. It's a, it's a published uh, pamphlet in the book format. It has uh, 142 pages plus an appendix of uh, 23 pages, which contains the original message of the two the party leaders uh, that is written mostly in reaction to an article in, uh, I think if memory serves a six page or eight page article in Nabar Bechal, number two, the bulletin of Fadayan was called Nabar Bechal, published on Farwardin Hazar Sisadopan or April 1974 on, and the title of that article that sort of instigated the, to the message to the Fadayan was Mao Zedong thought and our movement. And basically it was a, uh, it, it, was, it was about the way Mao Zedong revolutionary thought uh, can be, uh, you know, useful for, you know, revolutionary action in Iran without really committing to Maoism in a way. Um, allegedly it was written by Hamid Momani, but that's, that's another thing. It's not related to, to our uh, presentation here. So the operation, you know, that is the assassination of Shahriyari, must be understood in relation to the theory of armed propaganda as formulated by Bijan Jazani. This 1975 communique indeed is multifaceted, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of its aim. It celebrates an assault against Iranian security and one of its top operatives and informants. It dismisses the two the party for being passive and thus undeserving to be called a party, let alone the working class party. And it announces the refoundation of the Iranian communist movement through armed struggle initiated by the Fadai guerrillas. Equally, this largely polemical communique is built on an impressive use of literary devices to affirm its political points. The communique is an apex of a uh, complex triangular con political connection between the PFG to the party in exile and Savak. In one operation, the PFG strikes them both. By all measures, this communique and the microhistory surrounding it is a generation's reassertion of its decision to embark on armed struggle and to disown the past of its parent generation. <coughs> by executing the trusted member of the two the party who was simultaneously a security operative, the PFG condemned to the to living within its past fiasco that delayed, as Bijan Jazani would say, the liberation of Iranian people for about 20 years, imposing the task of the, that task on the generation of the PFG. The communique therefore signifies the deliberate attempt of the PFG to block dialogues with their to the leadership, despite the latter's delayed interest in the Marxist militants of the next new left generation. I just call, you know, refer to a PFG as new left. I'm not comfortable with that designation applied to these kinds of movements, militant movements. Uh, but, you know, just for a shorthand, I think it's a useful uh, thing. Uh, anyways, let's talk about the operation. Abbas Ali Shahriyari Najat, henceforth Abbas Shahriyari, was born in 1928 in the town of Kazerun in the oil-rich province of Khuzestan. He was hired as a worker by the Anglo-Iranian oil company and participated in the oiler strike of 1946 with his noted participation in, 19, in the 1951 strike as a union activist. His employment was terminated Following the 1953 coup, he was imprisoned a couple of times and for brief per periods before he migrated to Kuwait in 1955 and joined the cells of the two the cells that the Tudor Party had established among migrant Iranian workers there. In late 1950s, he was placed under Savak surveillance 
And while still a Tudor party member, he was recruited by Savak. According to one source, Shahriyari was on Savak payroll since January 1964 with source code 646. When in 1963, in the aftermath of crushing opposition that had arisen in the semi-relaxed uh, uh, period of 1960-63, the Tudor leadership, Tudor leadership in exile decided to reestablish a secret organization within the country. Shahriyari was deployed to Iran, among other Tudor cadres, including Sargor Razmi, engineer Masoud Masum Zadeh, Ali Khawari and Parviz Hekmatju, the latter being the two prominent, more prominent members. Um, Hekmatju was a former Iranian Air Force officer, member of the two the officers organization. Uh, the last two, Hekmatju and Khawari, as we know, it's just it's a side story, were arrested in Iran and Hekmatju lost his life in prison during an interrogation in June 1974, reportedly by committing suicide. <coughs> Uh, Shahriyari succeeded to recruit into uh, um, the two-day organization inside uh, the country known as the Tehran organization. Uh, you know, activists such as Dr. Iraj Wahedipur and Dr. Soleimani. <coughs> in any case, once in Iran, Shahriyari and his comrades established the two-day or the Tehran organization of the two-day party. The whole affair, of course, was facilitated by Savak in an effort to transform Tehran organization into an entrapment for capturing underground renegades. With Savak assistance, Shahriyari also created two the chapters in Khuzestan and Azerbaijan. He also published publications for two the organization, uh, for the Tehran organization of the two the party called Zamine Mardom. <coughs> And for Khuzestan organization, Sholei Junub. Uh, just, I said, you know, in my, uh, you know, I'm a kind of old fashioned PowerPoint presenter. So this is a copy of Sholei Junub that I hold like, this is my version of PowerPoint. Okay, and why I show you this, it's because incidentally, I was looking at this and uh, on the first page of this publication, there is a, a, a happy birthday message to Dr. Reza Radmanesh, Dabir Kolli Komite Markazi Hezbo Tudeh Iran, the General Secretary of the Tudeh Party of Iran. And given that this document, this publication is published by Shahriyari, but under Savak uh, uh, observation or, or uh, 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 regulations, uh, it's really interesting just to think about who knows about Radmanesh's uh, birthday, it's either Shahriyar was too close to Rod Manesh, and I'll come back to this, and he knew about this, or Sava gave them, you know, the, uh, the uh, birthday of Rod Manesh. So it's really interesting because Rod Manesh is the one who facilitated the whole thing. Shahriyar was trusted by two the party general secretary, Reza Rod Manesh, who stood by him after reports about his suspicious activities had reached the two the Central Committee by mid 1960s. To fast forward to later developments, the Shahriyari affair brought the internal conflicts within the two the party leadership to the fore. Rod Manesh was challenged by aspiring and kind of revolutionary or revolutionary minded Nuruddin Kianuri, who eventually was elected uh, to the General Secretary in 1978. But that's further out in history, it's not my fault. In any case, Shahriyari rose to lead Tehran organization as his comrades were gradually arrested by Savak such, as, such that their arrest would not be connected to Shahriyari. From this point onward, 1963, Shahriyari was in full control of Tehran organization. He exposed revolutionaries, including members of the Jazani Zarifi group, the Palestine group, members of the Tude, among other things, leading to or facilitating their arrest. Among the most significant things that he did um, that had a future impact on the militants of the 1970s was to recruit and direct Nasser Agayan to infiltrate 
the group formed by Bijan Jazani and his comrades, to which Hassan Ziyal Zarifi later joined, a group later known as Group One, whose survivors organized the Siakal insurrection and co founded the PFG, whose member Hamid Ashraf became the leader of the PFG from between 1971 and 76. So I'm trying to show the sequence of events. You know, it's a micro history, like each individual, how they were how they were positioned in certain positions and how that worked itself out through, through that you know, micro history. It was Avayan's tip that led to Savak, Savak intercepting and arresting members of group one in 1947. Um, the Tehran organization recruited many revolutionaries of this time only to expose them and have them arrested. Shahriari also played a key role in arresting the, uh, the remaining members of Group One and the Palestine group as well. You know, I, I can explain probably there's interest in Q&A how, how the Group One arrests were taking place, but you know, that's, that's also um, part of this history. Zia Zarifi was arrested when he was hiding in Dr. Iraj Wahedipu's um, residence upon Shahriari's tip. Still after all this, Shahriari arranged for the five fleeting members of Jazani Zarifi group to secretly cross the border into Iraq. Uh, but uh, in fact, only uh, to have three of them arrested by accident. In the 1960s, Shahriari went to the USSR to meet with Radmanish. Shahriari's cover was blown when in 1968, his Savak accomplished in Tehran organization, apparently, apparently named Malayeri, uh, on his way to illegally cross, illegally cross the border to Soviet Union to meet the two departing leaders, confess his true loyalty and mission of an arrest and interrogation by Soviet officials uh, after he crossed the border. The Soviets warned to the party about Shahriari, with Ra, uh, about Shahriari, but Radmanish still kept him in charge of the Tehran organization until Shahriari's arrest in 1970. The Shahriari affair revealed important frictions, as mentioned, within the two party leadership, uh, in particular between General Secretary Radmanish and ambitious and rising Nureddin Kianuri. I've mentioned that already. But this is the thing, the 13th plenum of Central Committee of to the party in 1969 received an extensive report from Radmanesh about achievements of the Tehran organization. But Kianuri, having received intelligence from Milanova, Milanovo uh, of USSR International Bureau Iran branch, uh, implicitly questioned Radmanesh's report. As a result, a three-man commission consisting of Radmanesh, Kianuri, and Donishian, and Donishian, as we know, was very close to the Soviets, voted two, uh, to one in favor of disbanding the Tehran organization. Furthermore, in the 14th plenum of Con Central Committee of the Tudor Party, the Shahriari fiasco caused the removal of Radmanesh as general secretary, and Iraj Skandari became the new secretary. That's probably not relevant to us now, to my story. So these moves aided by the Soviets um, caused Savak to take new steps. By 1970, Shahriri was a used up pawn and Savak decided to set up a televised confession to exploit Shahriari one last time. The TV public briefing aired in January, 1971 Day 1349 was hosted by Parviz Sabati, head of Savak Internal Security or Edare Sevom, uh, in which Abbas Shahriari appeared as Mr. Islami uh, or, quote unquote, the man with a thousand faces with his back to the camera. Savak used this opportunity to aggrandize its power, Savak's power. Uh, in locating and exposing every underground activity. Sabati bragged that Savak had 1 million informants in the country. Uh, what is known, however, 
is that about a month later, a team of militants attacked the Siakia Gendarmerie post, smashing the regime's myth of island of security and founding the guerrilla period in Iran. And uh, I've, I've written about that in a recent article on the 50th anniversary on, on Siakial in, in Persian, uh, and how basically there was this kind of armed propaganda was this realm of security versus the guerrillas smashing each other's claims and myths and so on and so forth, right? Which is a which also is is another component of of the history of the Iranian left that is often neglected because people don't look at things as, as objective events and do not much look at the implications and the kind of cultural ramifications of those e events. Um, for example, the, uh, the, the way people uh, looked at the guerrillas or Savak, uh, you know, in terms of these kind of, you know, al almost mystical, uh, uh, powerful creatures uh, and so on. But that's another story. In an extensive interview with uh, Iraj Skandari in Mardom, volume six, I have it here, volume six, number 70, or the Behesh or April 1971, pages one, four, and five, Skandari mentioned Shahriyari's name in passing and totally concealed his to the connection, right? And if you read that, uh, that interview, it's it's basically a bunch of very gross lies, you know. Just he just denies mostly everything. Um, in any case, after 1970, Shahriyari was given a number of positions after his retirement from security positions in Iranian embassy in Kuwait and in Asia, sorry, in Arya Ship Company in Abadan until he moved to Tehran with his family. According to the PFG, he disguised himself, but was eventually identified by the PFG and his residence exposed in Parcham Street near Kennedy Square in Tehran. It is not clear how he was identified given that uh, only one picture of him was published in a uh, to the party publication, Mardum. Um, let me just show you that also. Uh, because there's a point, uh, volume six, number 103, or it's December, page two. And this is basically, this is the man we are talking about. This is the picture of him that was published. The only picture existing of him. Now that picture goes probably back 10 years. Now how the Fadayan, uh, could actually identify him and in fact locate him remains a mystery. There are so many speculations and so many claims. It's, it's almost impossible to find out what happened, how, how they figured it out, okay? Uh, only the people who had met Shahriyari, and that was at least five years earlier, could recognize him. And uh, those were mostly entirely in jail, okay? So that's, that's another mystery surrounding this uh, event. Now, a few words about the communique. At 7.40, this is how the communique actually starts with this kind of very, you know, action movie sort of, you know, uh, you know, launching opening. It's just, it's amazing. At 7.40, the morning of 14, Esvan, Hazar Sisa or March the 5th, 1973, uh, Shahriyari was gone down by a five-member team of Fadai guerrillas led by Behruz Armavani. The assassination is reported in brief, but cold, exact, and descriptive terms in the communique. How the Fadai guerrillas identified him, even though he was disguised and located his residence, even though he remained a closely guarded, that remained a closely guarded secret, it remains a mystery, and all explanations and speculations offered to this day are unsustainable, including the ones that the uh, communique offers as if he was discovered by accident. Somehow he was just, they just bumped into him. In any case, he had some, Shahriyari had some undisclosed documents on him, plus Iranian and US currencies, 
I think about 400 US dollars and about, I don't know, four or $5,000 Iranian real, uh, sorry, if Toman, uh, that's a lot of money um, uh, that were all confiscated by the team. Just as a trivia, uh, it was said that he carried in, in his cane or walking stick, uh, he carried a machine gun. This is one of those, you know, fable. And they specifically took his machine gun away and gave it to Hamid Ashraf. And Hamid Ashraf just looked at him and said, well, it's, it's just a cane. It's just <laughs> well, a walking stick. There's no machine gun inside of it. So uh, the PFG named this assassination, interestingly, the Khosroi Ruzbeh operation. The communique states, in honor of martyred comrade Khosroi Ruzbeh, the outstanding revolutionary and honest communist who has been praised by our people, this operation has been named after Khosroi Ruzbeh. Clearly, this operation signified posing one to the E group if you might want to call it, against another, the revolutionary one who stood up to the 1953 coup and was honorably executed by the regime, as opposed to the ones compromised uh, by security because of the uh, reformist and passivist attitude to the, of the, to the leadership, which did not seek to offer any meaningful resistance to the coup and instead decided to flee by and large to the bosom of Soviet Union. That's basically the, the, the gist of critique of Fadayan, you know, against the Tudor party. That's, that, 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 that sort of discourse appears ev almost in every literature they wrote about the past events. This thread, this international contrasting, this intentional contrasting of the potential Tudor versus the actual Tudor runs through the entire communique. Most directly connected to this assassination is Shahriari's role in exp exposing the Jazani Zarifi group, which led to their arrest and to their assassination in prison a month and a half later uh, in prison. Incidentally, just a few days ago, while I was trying to put finishing touches on, on this uh, paper so that it would be presentable, I just brought, ran into a Stasi uh, document just by accident. And this Stasi document in German is reporting a, a, a Stasi uh, um, agent conversation with Ehsan Tabari. Uh, it's dated, I forgot to take the date, but uh, it's dated sometime uh, 74, 75. And Ehsan Tabari actually says that the assassination of Jazani Zarifi group is directly a, a retaliation by, by Savak is directly connected to the assassination of Shahriari. And so if Ehsan Tabari, assuming that Ehsan Tabari is not just speaking about his own opinion, but rather reflecting the opinion of the Central Committee of which he was a member, uh, I think that was probably the perception in the Central Committee. Now I have to work on that document. I haven't read the rest of it. It's just that, that section popped up, you know, when I was doing this research. So, uh, so basically, th that's also the perception of the two that the Jazani and Zarifi and every uh, the other members, six Fadais and two Mojahids, were assassinated in prison by, by, by Savak intelligence in reaction to the Shahri uh, um, assassination. Anyways, the communique's analysis, to some extent, approximates the analysis of Jazani and Zarifi of the Tudor party as a self-declared communist party that ceased to be the working class party after the group, uh, sorry, after the coup and uh, because it failed to partake in its revolutionary and libera liberatory duties. At the same time, the communique borrows discursive elements from Ahmad Zadeh Puyan founding group as well. So this is, this is a communique where both discourses and, and you know if you're familiar with the history of the pfg it's just it had two otherwise you know more or less diverging groups you know becoming one and each group had certain ideas for example um jazani and zia zarifi they called the to the party the communist party of the working class party of iran up until the coup but after the coup because they did not uh, 
partake in you know national liberation kind of action or mode of action and did not resist the coup they were no longer the working class party but ahmad zade in uh, in his uh, treaties uh, says that the Tudor party has never been a, a, a working class party in Iran. And Shoayan also says, another leftist intellectual, he says the same thing. So there's actually differences here. Um, so at the same time, the communique borrows discursive elements from Ahmad Zah, the Puyan founding group as well, in a manner clearly reminiscent of Puyan's influential pamphlet, uh, the key argument of the communique is that if the Iranian communists do not strike against the police system of Iran, if they do not engage in armed struggle against the regime, they will fall prey to Iranian intelligence and became, become ancillaries to the hunting down of other revolutionaries or true revolutionaries. Basically, that's what Puyan said in his very short uh, pamphlet. In short, this well assassination. Okay. You, you've been over 30 minutes. So can 30 you. 30 minutes. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, I just uh, say a few things and I, I skip the rest. Um, where am I? So, in a manner, okay, right, I say that. In short, the assassination is symbolically a critique of political, that is, non militant activism under Iran's police state. Um, to, to conclude, this long, this long uh, polemical communique entails an interesting engagement with, of a post to the new left contact uh, uh, with an aging to the leaders. In the published version of this presentation, if that ever comes out, using the structural analysis of fiction prose, I will show how political treaties uh, such as this deploy a number of literary devices by creating uh, systems of representation through signifiers that identify one group as distinct from another, and then they create this division between the two generations of activism. Other than that, it's really an interesting engagement uh, with the uh, with the two the party. Uh, the Fadayan wanted, however, in in trying to reject, uh, you know, the two the parties. Uh, 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 invitation you know, to enter dialogue with Fadayan. The Fadayan actually asked members of the Tuda party to join them and abandon their own party. So that's probably the most significant component of this, um, of, of this communique. And we have had Mr. Farjad actually uh, in another presentation uh, earlier to, to confirm that there were actually some revolutionary members within the Tuda ranks who believed in more revolutionary action. But on that, I just leave it there. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rahab Zadeh. Uh, there are already some questions for you, but we'll keep them for after our two other presenters are done. And uh, we uh, ask them to please, uh, let's keep it. We have time, but if you keep it under 30 minutes, then we have more time for Q's and, and A's. So uh, our second presenter is, um, I think since he has finished, now it's Do uh, Dr. Kamran uh, Geshniz Jani, uh, and uh, who is a researcher at Tarbiyat Mudarris University, Tehran. He recently defended his PhD thesis, so therefore, Doctor now in political sociology at Tarbiyat Mudarris University, Tehran, Iran. Uh, his main area of research uh, are revolutions, especially the Iranian Revolution of 1979, social movements, and Islamism. He's currently working on the collective memory of the 1979 revolution in today's Iran. And the title of his presentation is The Tudé Party's Position on the leading role of the combatant clerics in the Iranian revolution. Uh, please uh, take it. Please unmute your, yes, thank you. Hello everyone. 
first of all, I want to thank the Institute for Iranian Studies at St. Andrew University and all the people involved, including Thomas Halverson and Professor Matinaskeri for organizing such an amazing conference. My talk today is about how the two the party formulated and framed the central role of combatant clerics during the course of the 1978-79 revolution in Iran. But before uh, entering my main discussion, uh, I should note that this talk is based on one chapter of my PhD dissertation. Uh, in my dissertation, through a comparative analysis of the Iranian 1978-79 and Egyptian 2011-2013 revolutions, I examined the conditions that affect the dominance of Islamist movements in revolutionary situations. And as part of this, I examined how the Iranian and Egyptian secular parties, including the Tudeh party of Iran, framed the key role of the Islamists during the revolution. Before entering my main discussion, uh, I should also note that this talk is mostly based on a qualitative content analysis of the issues 184 to 224 of Mardom, organ of the Central Committee of the Tudeh party, and issues 2 to 73 of Navid, affiliated with the Tudeh party. This talk consists of four main parts. First, uh, the main strategy of the Tudeh party in the years leading up to the beginning of the revolution in January 1978 is mentioned. And then the changes in the two parties for violations of the leading role of the combatant clerics during the revolution will be examined in three different stages. Contesting the view in the existing journalistic and academic literature, which is mostly based on what happens in aftermath of the revolution, and mainly emphasizes the supporting position of the Tudor party and the central role of Ayatollah Khomeini and the combatant clerics, I will focus on and highlight uh, the changes in the party's stances concerning this issue during the revolutionary period, from ignoring to reluctantly accepting to almost fully supporting. First, uh, before the beginning of the revolutionary period, the main strategy of the Tudor party, at least from the middle of 1976 onwards, was to invite all political groups to form an anti-dictatorship front. As Mardom and Navid shows, uh, the, the main effort of the Tudor party in this period was to enter into an alliance of all political forces opposed the Shah, despite uh, their slight protests against the anti-communist uh, positions of the religious and nationalist forces. In this regard, they welcomed most of the protest activities carried out by various groups, including the Islamist ones. For example, we read in Mardom that the Tudor party of Iran, regardless of its clear assessment of, this, of the goals and motives of the individuals and groups participating in this struggle, consistently and sincerely support this struggle and will accompany it with all its might. Or for another ex example, uh, we have in Mardom this message, the message of unity especially to those forces that support national freedom and independence, which do not approve of our party's political and social goals and disagree with them. An interesting point uh, in this regard is that the to the party invitation to form an anti-dictatorship front did not include the Iranian Maoists. Uh, in other words, the to the party wanted to ally with religious and liberal nationalist groups, but refused to ally with the Maoist Marxists, with whom it was ideologically much closer. However, due to the historically hostile relationship between the clergy and the Tudor party, this party did not discuss much about the need for the clergy to enter the political scene. Uh, more precisely, although the Tudor party sought to portray divisions between the communists and the religious fighters, including the combatant clerics, as a conspiracy of the Shah's regime, 
at this period of time, political Islam was not primarily the two the parties preoccupation and they had neither fear nor hope in this regard. Here, it's also important uh, to note that in this month, the National Front of Iran and the Freedom Movement of Iran as the most important secular groups in that time have been actively seeking to bring the clerics to the fore. While as mentioned before, the Tudor party was largely passive and silent in this regard. If uh, we consider the beginning of the revolutionary period in January 1978, the formulations of the Tudor party from the clerics led revolutionary movement, I mean from January 1978 to February 1979, went through uh, three different stages. First, from January to August 1978, they largely uh, ignored the crucial role of the clerics in the movement and portrayed the protests as a popular movement against the Shah's regime with the same demands as those of the party. In January 1978, uh, for example, a number, a number of combatant clerics and Islamist supporters of Ayatollah Khomeini took to the streets in protest of an article against him in a Tel Aviv newspaper. And a number of them were, built, were killed by security forces. In response, the Tudor party described the protesters as anti-regime fighters and stressed that, quote unquote, the brave people of Iran will continue to fight for the restoration of democracy and the constitution. In addition, we read in Mardon that the people of Rome protested peacefully against oppression, against the plundering of the wealth of all the people by the regime's leader for bread and democratic freedoms and trade union freedoms. In fact, in the formulations of the Tudor party at this stage, on the one hand, uh, there is not much news about the Islamic demands of the anti-Shah protests. And on the other hand, the same demands that have existed in the main slogans of the Tudor party for many years are expressed as the demands of the people. At the same time, the Tudor party is not giving up uh, on trying to form an alliance with other opposition forces, including the Islamists. In this regard, the Tudor party sought to pave the way for such an alliance by defending Islamic forces against the Shah regime. For example, in a Navid article, uh, progressive religious people were acquitted of acid attacks on women, and, and the practice was attributed to Savak agents. Or for another example, the Mardom quoted a Soviet newspaper as saying that uh, most of the damaged cinemas were cinemas showing Western lifestyles and sexually explicit films. It's also noteworthy that uh, during this month, among the secular parties, it was the freedom movement of Iran and the National Front of Iran, and not the Tudor party that showed the most clear support for the clergy. In summary, at this stage, the Tudor party has perceived the events as an opportunity to fulfill its demands, unite with other political groups and overthrow the Shah's regime. The outspoken stance of Ayatollah Khomeini and a number of other clerics against the communists did not pose a serious threat to the Tudor party, although it did lead the party's central committee to remain cautious in dealing with the clerics. At uh, the second stage from August to October, 1978, the Tudor party reluctantly moved toward uh, accepting the leading role of Ayatollah Khomeini, while at the same time downplaying this leading role and framing it as something transitory. The Tudor party, which had previously uh, made every effort to reflect the religious aspect of the revolutionary movement as little as possible, found it very difficult to continue such a process after the August Ramadan, Ramadan and September 1978 protests. Thus, they formally acknowledged the religious leadership at this stage of the revolutionary movement, although they continue to try to show this leadership and central role as minor and transient. 
and in some cases less important than it was. It should also born, be borne in mind that the revolutionary movement of 1978-79 caused uh, divisions in many political groups and the Tudor party was no exception. Therefore, part of this acceptance of the leadership of the clergy while not accepting it uh, can be attributed to the internal differences of this party, especially between the Iraj Iskandari and Nuruddin Kiarnuri factions. As an example of this two-sided and ambivalent position, in response to the pro protests in Isfahan and Shiraz at this stage, which had a clearly Islamic orientation, the Tudor party acknowledged that in recent months, the activities of anti-regime clerics have become more widespread. But uh, on the other hand, stressed, although the clergy are at the forefront of these movements, the anti-government movement and demonstrations in Iran are of a popular nature in which the student masses and all political forces participate and support it. As another example that shows the formulations of the Tudor party at this stage, Iraj Iskandari, the first uh, or general secretary of the party at that time, in response to Eid al-Fetr demonstrations which led by the clerics, says that if the movement has now somewhat religious orientation, it should not be exaggerated, exaggerated too much. In short, uh, the Tudor party at this stage, I mean from August to October 1978, no longer considers it possible to continue his policy of ignoring the prominent role of anti-communist clerics and the Islamic dimension of the revolutionary movement. So uh, they move toward accepting Ayatollah Khomeini's leadership, especially by praising his stubbornness and by not consciously seeing his anti-communist framework. But at the same time, to the parties still trying to ensure that the movement is not limited to the clergy and that an alliance of different anti-Shah forces is formed. It should also be borne in mind that the, that the party's hostility to the imperial, to the Shah's regime was such that it clearly outweighed, outweighed any sense of danger from the anti-communist tendencies of the clergy. In addition, as in previous stage, in this stage too, among the secular political parties, it was mostly the National Front and the freedom movement of Iran that enthusiastically welcomed the entry of the clerics to the political arena. And finally, at third stage, I mean from uh, November 1978 to February 1979, and especially from January 1979, notwithstanding some independent positions and deemed pro protests against monopolization of the movement by the clerics, they almost fully support the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini. The shift of the Tudor party toward full support for Ayatollah Khomeini was clearly evident in its January 17, 1979 statement. In the statement entitled, the Tudor party of Iran clearly endorses the initiative of Grand Ayatollah Khomeini to form the Council of Islamic Revolution. They declared, quote unquote, the main assessment and positions of Ayatollah Khomeini's plan for the Islamic Republic are in line with the wishes of the Tudor party of Iran for the development of Iranian society at the current stage. Also, the full acceptance of Ayatollah Khomeini's leadership is evident in, in the stances of Nureddin Kiyanuri, who replaced Iraj Iskandari as, as the party's general secretary. Uh, there is not much difference between scientific socialism and the social content of Islam. Nureddin Kiyanuri said in an interview, and noting that the two, the party and Ayatollah Khomeini could work together for a long time. Kiyanuri also adds, uh, for the past 20 years, Ayatollah Khomeini has fought against the Shah and various forms of imperialist domination. His political views have evolved based on Islamic law. We fully support his initiatives to dismantle the monarchy, declare the Islamic Republic, form a constituent assembly to draft a new constitution, establish a national government to end imperial sovereignty, 
ensure democracy for the people, fight political oppression, and use national wealth for the sake of public welfare. The sub this support is not a temporary tactic, but a serious and clear position. Even when the interviewer specifically asked Kianuri, doesn't uh, the deeply Islamic policies of Ayatollah Khomeini worry you as a Marxist? Kianuri explains, Shia leaders have been in contact with the people in most for a long time. Shia religious beliefs have democratic roots. Shia leaders have always been associated with nationalist and anti-imperialist forces. For this reason, Kianuri adds, Ayatollah Khomeini has also gained our support by raising strong and decisive slogans against the Shah. The two, the party of Iran endorses the objectively progressive elements of their movement. We do our best to find common ground with them. We believe that in this, in this favorable moment, they are playing a very progressive role in the development of Iranian society. It's also noteworthy that despite all the efforts by the Tudor party to ally with Ayatollah Khomeini, he never accepted such an alliance at any level. In Ayatollah Khomeini's words, the Tudor party is a dirty party affiliated with the Shah's regime and, and all its slogans and efforts uh, are to weaken the Islamic movement and save the Shah from falling. In fact, in the historiography of the Iranian revolution, the statement of Ayatollah Khomeini that the Marxists are free to express their opinion has found a wide echo. However, the fact is that if we review all the positions of Ayatollah Khomeini in relation to the, to the party in particular and the communists in general during the revolution, we will find that this position does not in any way reflect his general position in this regard. And Ayatollah Khomeini had repeatedly and sternly denied any cooperation or alliance with the Tudor party. In addition, Ayatollah Khomeini had even ruled out the possibility of legalizing the Tudor party in the next post-revolutionary government. In fact, it was the Tudor party that consciously and to a great extent ignored, at least in, in its publications, the anti-communist positions of Ayatollah Khomeini. Moreover, uh, the Tuda party reflected Ayatollah Khomeini's call for universal unity, which clearly did not include the communists as if it included them. To conclude, uh, I would like to reemphasize on three points. First, the Tudor the party has not been inclined to accept the leadership of the clerics and Ayatollah Khomeini in particular since the very beginning of the revolution in January 1978. And it was during the events of the revolution and mostly in its last month that they were persuaded to move in this direction. Second, in contrast to what happened after the victory of the revolution in February 1979, among the main secular groups, it were the liberal nationalists of the National Front of Iran and the members of the freedom movement of Iran who had uh, accepted the leadership of, leadership of the clergy before and more than others, including the Tudor party in particular and the left in general. And third, in contrast to the dominant historiography of the Islamic revolution of Iran, it was not Ayatollah Khomeini who generalized his message so that everyone, including the Tudor party, would join him. But it was the Tudor party that deliberately ignored his strongly anti-communist message. Thank you for listening to me. On mute, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, now we're going to proceed to our last but not least uh, presenter, uh, which where he is uh, located shows the amazing range of our conference from Moscow to different cities in uh, across Europe, the US and of course Iran. Uh, including the University of Tarbiyat Modares, which is amazing. So I present us from there. And uh, 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 Professor Volkov, I don't know why they placed you last. Maybe it had something to do with distancing ourselves from Russia.
but your topic certainly is quite pertinent. It's the USSR and the Tudor party after the Islamic revolution of 1979, ideological cohesion and operative controversies. Professor Wokoff is the head of the center for the study of the Middle East, the Caucasus and Central Asia at the HSE University. He's also the head of the laboratory for the history of regional processes at Moscow State Linguistic University. So uh, Professor Wokoff, please go ahead and uh, take it from there. Uh, thank you very much, Afshin, for your presentation and uh, for my introduction. And uh, actually, uh, as a matter of fact, I just wanted to mention that uh, as far as I know, uh, it is very prestigious for uh, singers to open and to conclude concerts. So uh, it's the most prestigious place uh, just within the a concert. So I assume that uh, actually I owe uh, the organizers of the conference uh, uh, by this actually uh, place uh, within the conference. So, um, uh, first of all, I just uh, wanted to express uh, my profound gratitude to the organizers of this conference for conducting it with uh, uh, in this uh, enormously inclusive format. And uh, my special thanks go to Siawush and Thomas and uh, actually it's a great boon that uh, uh, we are able to uh, contact, to participate uh, in this conference from our countries and even homes. And uh, uh, I'm particularly glad uh, for my uh, Iranian friends, uh, for my colleagues in Iran, uh, that they also can participate in this conference from Iran. Durud Bardustan va hamkaron azizam. Okay, so I just um, uh, I'd like to uh, start out uh, with a very, in my opinion, illuminating uh, quotation, uh, which is very illustrative of uh, all those relations and perceptions that existed at that time especially in the early 1980s. And uh, um, uh, uh, I'm quoting, just let me, uh, let me share my PowerPoint with you. Uh, I was about to forget about it actually. Can you see this? Hello? Yes, we can. We can see it. Please ah, continue. We can excellent. See it. Excellent. So let me just uh, put you here. Okay, so um, uh, I'm quoting from uh, Leonid Shabarshin, who at the time from um, uh, May 1979 to uh, January uh, 1983, uh, was um, uh, the KGB station chief in Tehran. And uh, um, uh, uh, the information you will actually receive from this quotation is quite, um, uh, is quite important in terms of uh, uh, placing uh, uh, these things uh, into context. So uh, just let me... Uh, first of all, I need to, to mention that um, the term well wishes uh, uh, has been and is conventionally used by uh, Soviet or Russian intelligence services, um, sorry, in intelligence officers uh, in their memoirs. Uh, and of course, they designate um, uh, their informants or local agents by this word. So uh, Leonid Barshin in 1982 said or wrote, our well wishes, and there are not few in Iran, ask this question too. Many of them see the world in simplistic terms. The history of the beginning of the century seems yesterday to them, and they're puzzled. Does not Russia notice that her friends are being killed here and her enemies are getting stronger. 
cannot Soviet tanks cross the border to dispel the black obsession that has shrouded the country? The past, present, and future have mixed up in the minds of Iranians. Reality mixed up with ghosts, common sense with delirious fantasies. And the most important, nobody can understand what this distemper will end up with, whose lives it will take again, whom it will execute, and whom it will pardon. Diplomats found themselves in no better situation. So uh, let me just, um, OK. Uh, the outline for this uh, talk. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, we need to touch upon uh, uh, the historical background of the topic and to, um, to state the question. Uh, then explain actually uh, what uh, secondary sources I draw on. Uh, and of course, uh, we will talk about primary sources, which are an, uh, another key issue um, uh, in this context. And then uh, we will uh, get down to um, uh, uh, the uh, empirical history, so-called uh, itself. And we will see actually how, to what degree uh, Soviet diplomats, intelligence officers, uh, and uh, all Soviet organizations uh, were ready um, uh, to, to uh, such a phenomenon, to such an event as the Islamic Revolution. Uh, and of course, we will get down to, uh, uh, to those policies uh, uh, which were conducted by the Soviet government, after all, uh, and uh, what uh, obstacles, what hurdles uh, there were in this sense. Uh, and uh, of course, we will see actually how uh, the uh, today party um, could be situated within the broader uh, foreign policy context. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we will uh, conclude with outcomes and we will talk about um, uh, what influence actually um, uh, was put on uh, the today party by its dependence on the Soviet Union. Okay, so first of all, historical background. Few would deny the protracted close ties of the Iranian left with the USSR. Their foundations were laid as early as the participation of Russia's Social Democrats and Bolsheviks in the Marshal Protest. The 1917 developments in Russia and the early policies toward Iran raised new hopes in the Iranian left. However, from the early 1920s to the demise of Soviet ideology in the late 1980s, the USSR's inner strategic and tactical attitudes towards Iran's communist movement significantly diverged from what was perceived by Iranian communists themselves. I would argue that during this entire period, the USSR was uninterested in scale support of the Iranian communists and used them merely as one of its foreign policy tools, mostly against the influence of Western powers, following the old great practices and mentality. In this context, the late USSR's strategic considerations and mode of action toward the Today Party after 1979 are of particular historiographical interest. The argument historic evidence demonstrates that the USSR's final decision on the formation of its foreign policy towards the Islamic Republic of Iran, taken in the immediate aftermath of the Islamic Revolution, was to downgrade support of the today even further and to secure the preservation of the new regime. The Soviets decided to conduct this policy as long as the new regime continued its anti-Western rhetoric 
did not interfere with the affairs of the USSR South and kept the Americans far away from at least the Soviet Iranian border. And in doing so, the Soviet Union regarded the today as almost the only way to get closer to Khomeini, as well as the only most efficient source of information on Iranian internal situation. Uh, as I mentioned, um, well, of course, uh, my paper draws on the most um, uh, recent uh, scholarship, uh, but in addition to that, uh, it was uh, important to look into actually how those events were analyzed uh, in the early 80s, uh, uh, 1980s. And uh, among uh, those important works, uh, we can mention the works by uh, Muriel Atkin, first of all, and Ole Smolansky. Uh, however, uh, as uh, I think uh, many works uh, written on current events, uh, they, um, uh, they were unable to avoid um, uh, exaggerations and uh, maybe some uh, misperceptions. And of course, uh, all of them um, uh, gave too much agency to the Soviet Union uh, within those events. I mean, uh, the late 1970s and the early 1980s. However, uh, uh, speaking about uh, the most recent scholarship, uh, we need to mention um, uh, most important, the most important works by uh, John Parker and Clément Terre. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, I uh, did not uh, put it uh, on the slide. Uh, there is a monograph, a very important and interesting, insightful monograph forthcoming now. Uh, uh, its title is um, Representing Iran in Eastern Germany. Uh, and actually, it also uh, shows us how uh, the Soviet Union, among other things, it shows us how it delegated uh, its uh, right for ownership of, of the Tudor Party uh, to uh, a significant degree uh, to East Germany during certain periods uh, of time. Uh, in terms of primary sources, of course, um, uh, we need to mention, first of all, uh, archival collections, and they're most important. However, uh, all those archives, I mean, um, uh, controlled by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Russia, or for example, such archives as uh, Ergani or Gaspi, uh, and even uh, um, the archive of, of um, uh, of the in, uh, external intelligence of Russia, uh, they are mostly closed. And um, in addition to that, uh, I need to mention uh, uh, maybe uh, some um, uh, on, on a critical note. Uh, for the first time, I criticized uh, the uh, state of Russian archives uh, in 2012. Unfortunately, since that time, uh, the situation um, uh, has only deteriorated, uh, both in, uh, in the state, in the material state, in terms of the equipment and uh, uh, the uh, facilities they have, uh, but most importantly, uh, uh, the main problem is that uh, uh, a lot of documents, a lot of archival collections, that were declassified in the 1990s, unfortunately, after the year of 2000, uh, were reclassified. And this process uh, goes on now. Uh, so um, uh, uh, in the situation of, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, lack of primary sources in terms of archival documents, we need to refer to uh, other primary sources. And among them, of course, um, uh, uh, an interesting group of uh, uh, sources related to um, uh, Soviet and post-Soviet 
uh, iranology, but uh, specifically I mean here uh, those works that were authored by um, uh, Soviet Iranists, specialists on Iran. Uh, in the very early uh, 1980s, uh, uh, just in this, uh, during this specific period from uh, 1979 to uh, 1983, 84. Uh, another interesting matter in this, uh, in this context uh, is uh, the works of um, uh, other scholars worked uh, beyond uh, Iranian studies in the Soviet Union. And we will talk about them later um, uh, within my uh, further slides. Uh, it is interesting that uh, those scholars who were not Iranists, but uh, they found themselves uh, in most important uh, posts. Uh, I mean, uh, the International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, uh, they um, were the key decision makers uh, on, uh, on uh, the Soviet foreign policy towards the uh, Islamic Revolution and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And of course, um, uh, the, uh, I, I think the main bulk of um, uh, my primary sources consists of um, uh, memoirs and interviews. Um, by um, uh, uh, former intelligence officers, uh, diplomats, uh, and uh, uh, party functionaries. So, uh, the attitude uh, um, uh, of the Soviet government towards uh, the Today Party uh, naturally um, uh, resulted from uh, the broader context of um, uh, the USSR's foreign policy towards Iran, towards the uh, Islamic Revolution. And uh, in its turn, um, uh, uh, we need to look into actually uh, to what degree um, the Soviet government uh, had been prepared to the Islamic Revolution. Uh, by the late 1970s. Uh, and in this sense, I wanted to quote um, some key persons, some key individuals. And uh, uh, first, of them, first of them is uh, Vladimir uh, Kuzichkin, uh, a famous defector to MI6, who uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s worked uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the Tehran uh, residency of the KGB. So let us see actually uh, what uh, uh, Soviet diplomats, uh, intelligence officers uh, knew about uh, the events uh, uh, that were happening at that time uh, in Iran. Uh, Kuzichkin later wrote, in Tehran and throughout the whole country, Cassette tapes were being circulated, bearing the recorded speeches of some Ayatollah called Khomeini. The name of Khomeini meant nothing to us, even to the longest serving uh, officer in the residency. Uh, another key figure uh, in the sense, um, Lev Kostramin, who at the time was um, Actually, um, shortly before uh, Leonid Shibashin arrived in Iran, um, uh, uh, Lev Kostramin headed uh, the um, uh, KGB uh, station uh, in Tehran uh, for a couple of months. And then after that, he returned to Moscow and headed the eighth um, uh, section uh, of the first chief directorate of the KGB um, uh, working on Iran. Uh, and uh, his evidence is also very interesting. The weak point in our work uh, that had become clear as a result of our miscalculations in the preceding years was the lack of unofficial contacts with the representatives of the high ranking clergy. We just were prepared to them neither politically nor ideologically or morally. 
It was totally caused by our one-sided ideological training based only on the teaching of Marxism-Leninism, mostly learned not as a guidance for action, but as a set of unshakable postulates. In the beginning, it hindered our understanding of the role of Islam and clergy in the development of the Iranian revolution. In 1978, we saw the inevitability of the revolution, but thought that it would be bourgeois democratic and nationally liberating. And here comes Leonid Shubarshin, who actually headed um, uh, the KGB station in Tehran uh, in the, during the most crucial period uh, from uh, May uh, 1979 to uh, January 1983. The subject of our main interest was the relationships of Iran with the USA and the countries of Western Europe and particularly the activities of Americans in Iran. Uh, 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 he means now the, um, the activities undertaken by the KGB in Iran uh, uh, in the late 1970s. Later, and now he is talking about uh, the early uh, 80s, the questions of Iran's foreign policy toward the USSR came to the fore the export of the Islamic revolution, the Iran-Iraq war, and the questions related to Afghanistan. So um, uh, we can conclude that actually neither um, the Soviet intelligence apparatus uh, was ready uh, for the Islamic revolution, nor diplomats themselves, uh, as we can see um, in the memoirs, um, for example, of um, uh, Vinogradov, who at the time was the Soviet ambassador uh, to Iran, uh, and other diplomats who uh, worked uh, during that period in Iran. Uh, by the way, talking about uh, the memoirs of Vinogradov, um, we can uh, actually uh, judge um, uh, about the level of, um, of the knowledge of, of the country, of their work, uh, because was um, uh, we, we can see that uh, those memoirs were written by a rather simple-minded individual, uh, lacking knowledge um, uh, both in his in general history, and of course um, uh, uh, almost illiterate in uh, in questions related to uh, to the Iranian history uh, or Iranian culture uh, or everyday life in Iran. Uh, however, um, as we know, there was an interesting entity, um, uh, uh, a very powerful bureaucratic body uh, in the Soviet Union that, uh, especially in the 1970s and uh, the uh, 80s, shaped um, uh, the USSR's foreign policy uh, in different directions. And these are the main persons, the main individuals who uh, actually uh, were in the thick of the decision making process at that time. Uh, jumping ahead, I would mention that um, uh, Professor Rostislav Fulyanovsky uh, was uh, the handler of uh, 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 Kianuri. Uh, uh, because of some um, organizational issues, uh, we can actually uh, discuss them later during our Q&A session. Uh, I will explain you how actually uh, the, this mechanism uh, functioned in the Soviet Union because um, uh, 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 no communist party all over the world uh, was run or handled by the KGB or uh, the military intelligence. Uh, all those communist parties were handled by the uh, International Department of the, um, uh, of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And uh, in many senses, um, uh, this uh, organization uh, that consisted of um, several think tanks 
and also training centers, uh, the main of which uh, was the uh, higher party school, uh, uh, where actually uh, foreign communists uh, were brainwashed. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, in addition to some ideological classes in uh, Marxist-Leninist theory, uh, they were trained to, um, uh, to work with, uh, uh, to, to carry on uh, clandestine operations, uh, to handle um, uh, encrypted texts, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, and uh, uh, another interesting matter is that um, uh, the majority of them uh, um, actually, uh, uh, same uh, Ulyanovsky, uh, also Simonia and Reznikov, uh, they were uh, specialists in Orient, uh, specialists in Oriental in Oriental studies. However, uh, not in Iranian studies. Uh, um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, interesting enough, they um, uh, they were specialists on. Um, uh, Far East uh, and uh, uh, such countries as Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, for example, uh, Ulyanovsky was a specialist on India. However, uh, they uh, wrote um, a series of articles, especially Ulyanovsky, that determined um, the further development of, um, of Soviet Iranian studies because there was a kind of subordination we are going to talk about now. Uh, and uh, 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 for example, the Institute of Oriental Studies within the Soviet Academy of Sciences uh, obeyed um, blindly whatever was said, uh, whatever they received uh, on behalf of the International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So, um, uh, Precisely, these individuals determined um, not only the Soviet foreign policy towards Iran at that time, but also what, how actually Iranists, uh, how specialists, uh, how uh, scholars of Iranian studies analyzed um, uh, the Islamic Revolution. Um, I just uh, wanted to quote Ulyanovsky uh, with, the, um, uh, with uh, his characterization of the Islamic revolution and what was happening at the time. Uh, uh, and uh, this actually what he ended up with uh, by uh, 1982. The Iranian revolution is popular in terms of its multi-class character driving forces and methods, is un anti-monarchical, anti-monopolistic, and anti-imperialist in terms of its main orientation, is bourgeois democratic in terms of its urgent tasks on the condition of certain anti-capitalist tendencies, and, in Islam and is Islamic uh, in terms of its ruling role of clergy and its organizational ideological basis. We see that it was authored by uh, Simeon Agaev, uh, a famous Iranist of the time. Uh, but uh, in actual fact, uh, this was the um, uh, summing up of uh, what was written in Ulyanovsky's uh, articles um, uh, uh, during uh, 1979 and uh, uh, 1980 and 81. So what was the process of the decision-making on Iran? We see here on this picture how actually uh, different parts of this process uh, communicated with each other. And mostly we see uh, two vector relations uh, 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 between them. Uh, we see that actually uh, late Soviet Iranology had uh, uh, no influence on uh, other uh, uh, key uh, entities or organizations uh, within the Soviet Union whatsoever. However, uh, there was a certain um, uh, Iran commission established immediately after the Islamic Revolution. Um, 
uh, consisting of uh, uh, the Minister of Defense, um, uh, Brezhnev himself, uh, Suslov, uh, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Andropov as the chief of, uh, K of the KGB, uh, and of course, um, uh, the International Department uh, was represented there by Panamarov, by its head. However, uh, the most interesting thing that uh, neither nor Panamarov attended to the uh, meetings of this commission. And uh, eventually all uh, decisions uh, were taken uh, uh, under the influence of Ulyanovsky, uh, who participated in uh, every uh, meeting of this commission. Uh, together with Suslov, who actually had uh, uh, direct access to Brezhnev. Um, finally, um, the, um, the Soviet government came to a conclusion that um, they needed to pursue uh, the so-called real politique, because uh, first of all, um, uh, there was a kind of uh, Mossadegh complex. It was mentioned actually during the first, the first day of our conference. Uh, in 1953, uh, the Soviet Union actually missed out uh, any opportunity to influence the events. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, at that time, um, uh, Suslov headed the international department. However, the international department was not uh, that powerful at the time. And of course, we need to uh, bear in mind that uh, uh, Stalin died in March 1953. So um, uh, uh, the Soviet leaders of the time just uh, did not have time uh, for Iran to deal with Iran. Uh, they were busy with uh, just dividing or struggling uh, for power uh, inside the USSR itself. But this time, of course, uh, Suslov was firm. And uh, uh, this also um, actually um, uh, was taken over by Brezhnev, who as early as uh, uh, in, uh, on the 19th of November, 1978, uh, put uh, the US on note, actually, on notice that uh, the Soviet Union that maintains traditional good neighbor relations with Iran decisively declares that it is against any interference with the internal affairs of Iran done by anybody in any form and done under any pretext whatsoever. It must also come clear that any or even worse, military interference with the affairs of Iran, a state directly bordering the Soviet Union, would be regarded by the USSR as an act affecting the interests of its security. So from the outset, um, the Soviet Union um, just um, determined uh, the red line for the, for the USA. Uh, sensing actually uh, the uh, free of charge uh, success, unexpected success. And uh, this was related to the fact that just uh, in a blink of an eye, out of a sudden, uh, thousands of, uh, of the US military were ousted from Iran. Yeah. And in addition to, 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 to that, uh, um, Iran withdrew from center. Uh, moreover, uh, there were two important intelligence bases, uh, uh, one of them in the vicinity of Mashhad and another one uh, in the vicinity of Tabriz. Uh, uh, they were monitoring uh, whatever aerial activities and military activities uh, in Central Asia, in Soviet Central Asia, and also in the Caucasus. So um, just in a blink of an eye, um, uh, it, uh, the Soviet Union regarded it as um, uh, uh, heaven's gift um, and wanted to, um, to preserve it uh, by all means. 
So uh, in actual fact, uh, the Soviet Union turned out uh, as, as the greatest contributor to the survival of the Islamic regime. And uh, hence the attitude of, of the Soviet U Union to, towards the to their party. Uh, as it was mentioned both by Leonid Shebarshin, who uh, was uh, briefed by uh, Andropov uh, shortly before his arrival to Iran, um, uh, uh, the Soviet top brass, um, the KGB, and also uh, uh, the International Department of the Central Committee, uh, they all uh, were sure that there was no future for the Tudor party. And uh, the, only, um, uh, the only the aim, the only um, just use they um, uh, could, uh, uh, could have uh, out of this situation uh, was to use the Tudor party as a kind of um, uh, uh, means of uh, getting closer to Khomeini because of, because of um, uh, the appointment of uh, Nuruddin Kianuri. Uh, Volkov, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, I am just, I'm wrapping up. Over 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Uh, uh, specifically uh, because of the fact that he was a relative to Khomeini. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to that fact, um, uh, they needed uh, uh, information. Uh, uh, about the internal situation in Iran. So, um, here actually I wanted to uh, uh, show you uh, a, a document uh, from the Stasi archives uh, shared with me by, uh, kindly shared with me by Siavush. Uh, and it is um, a letter authored by Keanu Ri. Uh, addressed to um, uh, to the international department uh, of of uh, of the central committee of the uh, communist party uh, requesting uh, weapon deliveries uh, uh, and saying that um, uh, 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 most likely uh, there would be a civil war and we need weapons uh, just in case and uh, uh, this letter was just ignored by the international department. So um, the um, analysis carried out by the international department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party uh, demonstrated that uh, there was no any danger whatsoever in terms of Islamic fundamentalism for the Soviet South. And uh, at the same time, uh, there were no prospects uh, for the left for foreseeable future in Iran. Instead, uh, great strategic gains were stated uh, by the International Department. And from the very first moment, uh, so-called realpolitik prevailed. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it, turned down it turned out in a way that the USSR uh, became the main uh, geopolitical guarantor of the regime survival in Iran. And of course, uh, uh, everybody were uh, convinced that uh, the Tudeh party was doomed in any case. However, yes, some uh, certain activities uh, just uh, expedited uh, the issue. However, uh, the Islamic Revolution, in addition to uh, strategic gains uh, for the Soviet Union, presented uh, new foreign policy challenges. And uh, uh, the main uh, challenge was Afghanistan. Uh, as much as the Soviet Union contributed to the uh, survival of the Islamic regime in Iran, I would argue that uh, uh, almost to the same degree uh, the Islamic revolution contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because uh, um, uh, in 1979, the Soviet Union came to a conclusion that uh, there were two main dangers, the spread of the um, Islamic fundamentalism um, onto Afghanistan. And of course, uh, the US penetration uh, uh, into the country 
uh, with the Mr. aim Walker, of I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're not 10 uh, minutes yeah, over the time. Yeah, just uh, a couple of sentences. Uh, so uh, to establish uh, the same basis, military basis there. And of course, yes, we, uh, we need to mention that uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, this dependency on the Soviet Union um, uh, uh, resulted in uh, the eventual failure of the Today Party in Iran. And uh, we need to mention also uh, the uh, two uh, crucial uh, dates, uh, 1920 and 1941, uh, which designate that uh, both uh, the Today Party and its predecessor, the Iranian Communist Party, they were established in Iran during uh, uh, the Soviet occupation of the relevant parts of this country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Volkov. Uh, there's ample time for Q&A, and so you can even uh, you know, bring in some of the points you're making, more points in answering questions. I'm going to uh, try to pose all of the questions that are here. And if uh, they're not all evenly distributed to all three presenters. So if you could uh, uh, give quick answers, then I can pose more questions that might be uh, directed to you. Uh, so the first uh, question comment that came in, I just read it. It's, uh, it says, why instead of the politics of the Tudeh party in the historical context, we focus on the Shahriyari case, which is a classical case of police infiltration. We have already read a lot about it several times in various writings as a vulgar story of spying, when will we see a serious analysis? Only uh, Abrahamian has done it. And the same um, person is also adding, uh, and I suppose, I think pretty much sure it's directed to Professor Vahabzadeh. It is fashionable to consider the executed or imprisoned leaders of the today as revisionists is it assessed on historically studied facts or it may be directed to someone else? These are two, two separate ones. So the first one, I think, Professor Bahabzadeh is for, for you. Uh, please take it. Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the two things in that question that stood out for me, that number one was the word instead. We are not doing instead. We are, not, we are all looking at history and nothing we say about history replaces something else. We just add to historical observation, right? And secondly was the word vulgar that stood out for me. It's just, it's been debated in that way, the Shahriyari affair, but the Shah, what I'm saying is that Shahriyari affair has a theoretical and political significance. Uh, yes, um, we all know that Savak was about, I don't know, the internal security of Savak has, has about 3000 members, not a million as Sabati said, and they had about 10,000 informants or so, 10, 15,000 informants with the code name. But this is one case, and, and a lot of, former political activists, you know, went through this process and sort of, you know, uh, gave up and, and became informants of Sabak. Uh, not many of them, but, you know, there, there are, you know, several cases that we know of. But this is, this is the most significant case in the, in the, in the sense that you have, you have someone who basically, you know, decides to join, you know, work as an informant for Sabak. And, you know, that has happened before. But, actually it takes is directed and coached by Savak to take an active role in the 1960s. And that's the 1960s is the time when this sort of new left is trying to emerge out of the shadows of the Tudor party and so on. So what I'm saying is that this assassination, once we put aside you know, all the you know, execution or all the description and so on, has a very, has a very interesting theoretical significance for the way 
that the new generation thinks of the old generation. That's it. Uh, okay, and the next question was, uh, it was about the today as revisionist, where the executed or imprisoned leaders of the today revisionist, is this based on uh, historical facts? I think this question, uh, any one of our three presenters, if you want down the line, maybe you can say something about this. So I'm going to go to uh, the next question. Again, this was from an anonymous attendee and they say, there was also the Guru Munshaib of the Fadayan who joined the Tudeh, do you know them? And I believe this was already answered by uh, the other day, but maybe you briefly want to say something to this Professor Babzadeh. Please briefly, Thank because you, yes no. you can just call, please call me Paymon. This Professor Ravzad, it takes too long to say. Uh, so, uh, yes, um, yes. And in fact, one of the things, yes, we all know that there has been a Guru Munshaibin, a, 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 about, about 10 people within Tehran uh, sort of bureau or Tehran organization of the Fadais, uh, led by Turaj Haydari, Big Van, Siamaki Kalambur, and so on. And, and they, about 10 members, and out of about 40 members at the time in 1975 or so, I, I'm relying on my memory, which is not good. It's all in my book, but, uh, and they, they sort of, in, in a long process, they actually emerged, you know, and, and defected basically, and emerged out of the Fadai gorillas, and in a process of finding themselves and what they wanted to do, you know, on, on the eve of the revolution, they joined the Tudor party. But, uh, uh, so the thing was that one of the things that came out of the uh, Shahriyari affair was that was another assassination of, of a you know uh, defector, and that was Ibrahim and Ibrahim Nur Shirvanpur, who was a polytechnic student in the late 1960s, uh, connected to Kafur Hasanpur, who revived the remnants of Jazanese group and Jazanese network. Uh, uh, and, uh, and he was he was also assassinated simply because in prison he gave up, you know, and he, you know, he was not at the stature of, of Chahriyar or whatever, but this seemed to become a trend among the Fadai and to just, you know, assassinate their defectors and so on and so forth. And that was, again, thinking about micro history and little links, and that was one of the main grievances of the uh, 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 of the Monshaibin group, aside from ideological differences, that you're just going around and killing people who just, for whatever reason, give up on politics. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, there's a question posed in the chat uh, space, and that is for, again, for, for Paymon. Uh, and it's uh, considering that the code name for Shahriyari's assassination was Khosro Ruzbeh, do you think that the Fadayan's ideology of armed struggle was at all influenced by the military officer organization of the Tudeh party and their influential, in quote, martyrs? Uh, I am... Um entering the speculative interpretive realm of writing history and my answer is positive yes in fact i don't i have not seen in any major uh, engagement with the to the party in the writings of either pre fadayan fadais or during the fadayan that they 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 stopped admiring the you know hostra or or um, or or you know by implicitly the officers' organization. So I think that was actually a sort of, uh, you know, I, I think history is made of two parts, the parts that were actualized and the, the parts that never actualized. So I think the Fadayan, in a sense, felt that the potential for national liberation was within the two and was not mobilized by, by the, you know, leadership and so on and so forth. So it, you know, in, in a way, it can be it can that element never played in history can be brought back, right? And that said, it's uh, you know um, just Mr. Fajot said the other day that there were actually members, younger members of the Tudor Party outside who who were really revolutionary and you know to some extent believed in armed struggle and so on and so forth. So I think whether the Fadayan knew that there was such a tendency within Tudor because in their communique they actually invited. 
the honest members of the party to join the Fadayan and leave the leadership. But this is what I know. Thank you. Okay, the next question, again, I'm reading it from the chat. Uh, I believe it's directed to uh, Uh, well, I'm just going to read the question. It says, what was the evidence of rejecting Maoist groups in the United Front against the dictatorship during the revolution? Uh, so, um, uh, I don't know who wants to take this. It's uh, to me, I guess. Yes, I think it is to you, uh, Dr. Geshe Uh As I said, the main uh, material for my research was Mardo, the central uh, the organ of the central committee of the Tudor party and uh, Navid, affiliated with the Tudor party. And if we read the, these two journals in 1976, 1977, 1978, uh, uh, both of them are full of uh, the statements against the Iranian Maoists. They are full of evidence in, the, in these two publications for this, in this regard. Thank you very much. Uh, next question goes back to uh, Paimon. Uh, it's from Professor Abrahamian. Two brief questions. First, uh, I didn't catch the exact year when Shahriyari became a Savak informer. And then the second one is, was there any significance on the date of Shahriyari's assassination, uh, 5th March? As usual, it's everyone's questions are always great. Uh, 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 60, 19, uh, okay, I said in my presentation that according to one source, so I'm being very cautious about this because this one source is you know one of those secondary sources from Ministry of Intelligence, and these have to be treated with, with a lot of caution and has to be uh, you know cross-referenced with other things. But what I have is 64, 1964, but that's when when the do apparently the document that's behind this claim, the Savak document that's behind this claim, uh, uh, registers Shahriyari as 646 agent or whatever informant. Right, but I must say that it was not everyone grew in the ranks of Sabah the way Shahriyari grew. You know, like I said, there were many former activists who became informants, and we, they just stayed informants. Right, they they did not really try to create uh, 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 proxy organizations and so on and so forth. Right, but uh, but what I almost am. Um, sure about is that this this was a process that started in kuwait and he was recruited so to speak as kind of informant just very you know like ordinary informant while while working uh, among the two the workers in kuwait uh, and so on and, and the second one was sorry i forgot the second question okay the second one is uh the significance, was there any significance on the date of Shahriyar's assassination, 5 March? Uh, three days with him, that day, uh, uh, the rest of his party was founded. I'm not sure if that's significant, but you know, I was looking at, yeah, what's the significant significance of that? I'm not sure if that's, that date relates to Khosrow Ruzbe. I have to look it up, I haven't. But you know what? What I have looked is just what happened in Esfahan Hazar Sisal Panjo. Saying, "Oh, uh, Rastakhi's party unified Iran." I'm not sure if that's the date, like Khosrow Ruzbe was executed or whatever. I have no idea. Uh, okay. Uh, next question, I believe, is for Geshnis Jani. and it is: What was the explicit evidence that Khomeini rejected? legalizing to their party in the month before the revolution or i don't know revelation or i'm not sure is it i believe it i'm not sure it's because it's spelled in a way that could be read revelations i suppose it's revelation uh, there is an i uh, yes uh, there's an interview in paris 
one of the many interviews that uh, were taken with Khomeini, I Ayatollah Khomeini, and in one of them, the interviewer asked about the two dep and Ayatollah Khomeini answered that uh, we will not legalizing the two dep party. It's existed in Saifiya Imam and uh, in some other uh, books, maybe. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, it's about, I think it's directed to Professor Volkov, but you probably answered it. What do you know about Kwasichkin, who was a Soviet diplomat defected from his post in Iran? Well, uh, Avshin, I need two more hours for that. It's a long story. I, uh, the only thing I can recommend, uh, there is a remarkable book uh, authored by Vladimir Kuzichkin, uh, My Life in Soviet Espionage. Uh, so it's about his activities, uh, it's about his life, how actually he uh, became recruited by the KGB and uh, how he worked, how he defected and so on and so forth. So I can point you to that monograph. Uh, it is available on the internet. Excellent. Thank you for not taking two hours. Uh, so <laughs> the next one is also for you. And this one may take longer. Has Professor Volkov found any evidence linking the two the, linking the two the party leadership members with KGB as it has been claimed by the Islamic Republic and to the party opponents? As I said, um, uh, the KGB never ran uh, communist parties um, uh, just uh, abroad. Uh, they all were handled by the international department, which uh, on its own was, um, uh, so to speak, uh, the third uh, clandestine structure or body or organization within the Soviet Union. Uh, so even more clandestine the, the, than the KGB itself. So in addition to think tanks, it had training centers, as I mentioned, and um, they taught um, foreign communists who actually uh, used to be invited to the Soviet Union via third country. Um, and they uh, were trained there also in uh, um, just in the skills of encrypting uh, texts, uh, uh, carrying out uh, clandestine operations and so on and so forth. And um, uh, specifically uh, uh, in 1979 and 1918, um, uh, 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 also Ulyanovsky put pressure on Andropov and uh, um, forced, uh, forced Andropov to issue orders um, uh, that uh, the um, uh, KGB operatives in Iran um, uh, should serve as a kind of um, uh, transmission link between uh, the Today Party and the international department. So um, uh, the KGB operatives uh, had no right uh, to uh, decrypt, to decipher uh, whatever was um, uh, handed over on behalf of Nureddin Kianuri uh, to uh, Ulyanovsky. And Ulyanovsky directly um, actually handled uh, Kianuri uh, from Moscow, but uh, in the uh, I mean, sorry, indirectly, so without any personal meetings. But all, all personal meetings with Ulyanovsky, they took place, uh, uh, the meetings of uh, Keanu Ri uh, took place in Moscow, because uh, as we know, uh, Keanu Ri returned to Tehran only in April 1979. Uh, by the way, after uh, uh, being trained in that uh, party, uh, uh, higher party school uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And nobody, uh, including Vladimir Kuzichkin, um, who was entrusted uh, to um, take these messages uh, from Keanu Ri and to pass them over uh, to Moscow, uh, they uh, were unable uh, 
to read those texts, uh, they, uh, um, uh, they were obliged to translate them. Uh, Kuzichkin and other uh, interpreters uh, in the Soviet embassy, but they were encrypted. So uh, in actual fact, uh, uh, they translated them uh, into Russian, but uh, uh, they could not understand the meaning of that of those texts. So uh, there is no actually KGB. It was not a conventional uh, spy game. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, those practices uh, that were used by um, uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union uh, in, in terms of handling other communist parties all over the world. Okay, thank you, Professor Volkov. There's about 10 more questions and I'm not sure how much more time we have. Uh, uh, I, if our presenters, and we also need some time for uh, concluding remarks by uh, Professor Ranjbar de IME. So uh, if our presenters agree to give real quick, like less than one minute answers, I can go to the end of these 10 questions. Uh, should I just do that? So quick, quick question or comment, please less than a minute uh, response. Uh, and then the next one is, uh, uh, was the USSR influenced the two their parties policies towards Khomeini and the Islamic revolution? How much and how? This is claimed by all opponents of the party, including the Islamic Republic, which executed its leaders. Uh, yes, it was the initial idea uh, to get closer to Khomeini via Kianuri. And uh, um, in his reports, uh, I mean, Nuruddin Kianuri, uh, in, co in contrast to the fact that he analyzed the internal situation in Iran at that time um, uh, rather objectively, uh, whatever uh, concerned his own party was exaggerated. And in every report uh, about the activities of his party and his links uh, to Khomeini, uh, he always stated that um, uh, according to some rumors or according to information from uh, some sources close to Khomeini, and then he always mentioned that um, uh, the uh, popular support uh, for the Tudde party was growing, uh, that uh, uh, Mujahideen and Fadayan um, looked up uh, to, uh, to the to the party uh, and so on and so forth. So yes, but in actual fact, uh, uh, both Ulyanovsky and uh, uh, also uh, other, uh, other functionaries within the international department, they came to a conclusion that uh, nothing um, uh, was possible to do uh, just in this sense. And um, um, uh, the, the influence of the Tudé party uh, was not uh, that had been expected. Okay, uh, please give uh, quick answers. Professor Volkov, a lot of questions are for you and answering them will take like month, but please, if you can just give quick answers so I can pose all of them. The next one is uh, from Paimon. After the arrest of Tudeh leaders, Ulyanovsky in a published paper blamed the Tudeh party leaders for having misinterpreted his theory of the non-capitalist path to development, which constituted the theoretical foundation of the Tudeh support for clerics. Do you remember anything about it in the context of your research? Uh, it just uh, confirms, supports my general idea that uh, between uh, these two uh, uh, maybe allies, uh, as we can uh, possibly uh, put it, of course, uh, the Soviet Union opted for, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the preservation of its uh, good contacts with the regime. And that's why actually there was no uh, proper response uh, for the uh, for the crackdown uh, after the crackdown on the Tudeh party. Okay, thank you. Quick question again, Professor Volkov. 
would you please share your insight about Salashkar Mugarabi's case? To what extent do you think his intelligence sharing with USSR shaped the USSR's position toward the 1979 revolution? Uh, well, two answers very quick. Uh, the first is that, um, uh, of course, uh, it, was a, uh, uh, it was a valuable source, but uh, the uh, eventual uh, uh, the eventual body that analyzed uh, that information was the international department. And actually they were in the captivity of their ideology. And actually they looked uh, uh, at all those events. Uh, I mean, the Islamic revolution and the next following events through the prism, um, through that, um, um, uh, I mean, uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, ideology trying to put whatever was happening at that time into the context of um, uh, those ideas and those postulations. And the second answer is that, um, well, uh, again, you can find it in uh, Kuzichkin's monograph. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Mogharibi case, uh, when actually the KGB uh, became aware that uh, uh, the Savak archives uh, fell into the hands of Mujahideen, uh, they entrusted uh, uh, KGB officers in Tehran to contact their only, uh, their only informant uh, in, uh, within the Mujahideen, and it was Saudati. And unfortunately, uh, because of unprofessional um, uh, actions uh, undertaken by uh, in such a uh, complicated situation, uh, this contact uh, uh, was disclosed. And uh, you know that uh, later Saudati was executed. Uh, and so actually the KGB um, uh, lost its only uh, informant within uh, uh, such crucial uh, organizations. Okay, well, again, there are more questions or actually comments for uh, Professor Volkov. If you could, if the comments, maybe you can just let them pass. And if the questions, quick answers. Uh, and they, this one calls you Mr. Volkov. Thanks for your speech. It's very good details. But let me mention to you that Today Party of Iran did not establish in occupied region. It was a democratic Azerbaijan organization in occupied regions. Sorry, it was not uh, Tehran uh, occupied or controlled by the Soviet army. Uh, we are now working with Professor Tobaki on a project um, about uh, Soviet refugees in Iran. And uh, uh, Professor Tobaki found very interesting documents uh, showing that uh, even um, more than 500 um, uh, uh, Russians were extradited by the British to the Soviets from uh, the British zone of occupation, let alone the Soviet zone of occupation. And we know that uh, there was a total cleansing of uh, uh, Russians uh, in Iran. Uh, they were, um, all of them, they, uh, they were arrested. Uh, some of them were executed on the spot and the rest were sent uh, via Tashkent to, to the Gulag. And uh, so uh, can you imagine that uh, a communist party can be established uh, uh, in such an atmosphere uh, in, in Iran uh, uh, and with, with the presence of the Soviet army and be independent uh, of, of uh, actually uh, the Soviet policies in Iran. Okay, two, two quick, one, one comment uh, is Savak had just over 5,000 employees. The figure uh, 3,000 is incorrect. And once again, Professor Volkov for you. Are there any archives open to public in Russia regarding the Soviet Republic of Iran? Uh, well, there are, for example, you can find a lot of documents in Ragaspi, uh, the archive for social political history. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, in, uh, um, in the Russian military archive, 
but unfortunately, some of them are still classified. But the bulk of them, yes, you can you can find them quite freely. Okay, and uh, again, a repeat question from yesterday about the two day parties archives. It was moved from Leipzig to Moscow. Which Russian government agency is holding the archive and is it publicly accessible? For years about the today, sorry, I missed it. The question, the question is uh, to the party archives uh, were moved from Leipzig yeah. to Moscow. Is uh, it open? Which who holds it and is it open to the public? Uh, well, it's hard to say. Uh, there are documents in Gaspi and Ghani, but uh, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the situation is deteriorating uh, uh, gravely. And uh, even, um, uh, for example, um, uh, the, uh, as an example, I can mention um, uh, in Gaspi, there, there is a collection of uh, articles. Um, from um, uh, from foreign press, from foreign media, uh, mentioning uh, Mossadegh. Just the basis of the selection was this: uh, during the 1950s, uh, made by some uh, party functionary. Uh, just the collection of articles uh, from foreign media, and uh, it has been reclassified uh, recently again. So uh, if you're after some uh, uh, interesting documents now, uh, well, I don't think that uh, it will be possible to find anything. Okay, next question again is for you, but I think this is a question you've answered. So maybe we can quickly move over this one. And as what do you mean by Keanu Re handler was Ulyanovsky? Also, are there any KGB members in Central Committee revealed by the KGB documents you had access to? I believe you answered this question. Yeah, I just uh, said that um, uh, Keanu Ri directly reported to Ulyanovsky. That's it. Yes. Okay, now, uh, thank God, we go back to someone else, Paymon. <laughs> uh, can you explain about Navid Underground Magazine in uh, by Rahman Hatefi, Navid group, which was related to Iranian to their party. You kind of answered this question. So if you could briefly mention that magazine. Yeah, uh, Navid is an interesting uh, phenomenon that I need to study. I haven't, you know, I'm trying to cover movements of the 60s and 70s in my career if I, if I last that long. But uh, the thing, Navid is significant because remember the Fadoyan said if to the uh, in response, in, in the communique about Shahriar, if, if Tudor wants to become a, remain an underground political group, it will only yield uh, to the police and become a police spy nest or whatever. Navid actually disproved that and showed that in fact, it is possible for a non-militant uh, underground organization to, to just do, you know, if they, you know, observe all security things and so on, to just proceed and, and and be politically active and so on and, and you know publish without being a militant. So basically Navid is a is a disproving of, of the Fadayan's thesis. And it took place by the way after the Fadayan's demise in 1976. Thank you. Okay, we have some uh, good news for everyone. We have two questions left and uh, one is very uh, specific uh, from Professor Atabaki again to Paymon. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Why Khuzestan was opted for Shahriyari's setup network to publish Shole Junu? Why not Esfahan, where to their party had better network in late 1950s and early 1960s? Yeah, Turaj Aziz Salam, and that's a great question. Of course, we know why Tehran, because there were activists like that Shahriyari knew, Dr. Mahadipur, and they, they also brought in. Uh, uh, other people, Khavari and so on. So it's obvious why Tehran. But Huzestan, again, remains a matter of speculation. I haven't seen any anything in, in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the publications that I, I'm reviewing. My, my speculation is that because 
um, in the late 1950s, Shahriari had been working with Iranian workers in oil fields of Kuwait. You know, these are migrant workers, so they, you know, some of them in those, you know, cells or whatever, uh, might might have migrated back to Iran, and then Shahriar used those old connections to create a chapter in uh, in Khuzestan. That's my speculation. I haven't seen any evidence. Uh, very last question. I believe it goes back to Professor Walkoff again. Did the UK embassy have a role in the mass arrest of their members in relation to Kozichkin? Well, that's a famous story because uh, Kuzishkin defected to MI6 and uh, actually shared uh, all uh, information he knew about his contacts within uh, the Today Party. And then MI6 uh, shared this information with CIA. And uh, CIA uh, naturally shared this information with the Islamic regime. Uh, and uh, 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 there was the outcome. But, uh, well, it is argued by some um, researchers or some individuals that uh, it is Kuzichkin to blame uh, that uh, actually uh, there was a total crackdown on the Today Party. But sooner or later, it uh, would have happened uh, in any case without Kuzichkin's defection. So uh, Khomeini was cleansing uh, its political field uh, was consolidating its pa his power. So, uh, and uh, the Today Party was, uh, regardless of its weakness, anyway, uh, it was uh, uh, an obstacle. And also, uh, their ties, their connections with the Soviet Union were obvious. Uh, in any case, um, uh, the destiny of the uh, Today Party uh, was sealed. Thank you very much. There's a one last comment, which says there are undercover elements of CIA and MI6 in the Islamic Republic. I believe we have taken <laughs> all of our time uh, uh, covering Q's and A's. And I thank you all our presenters for your patience, staying and answering questions. Uh, the 34 people who were there are still here. And I like to Pass the to uh, Professor Ranjbad Daimi concluding comments on the panel and the conference. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Afshin. Uh, thank you very much to all the um, uh, uh, panelists uh, for their kind. Uh, um, participation in what was an in, a very interesting panel, and it, I think it was a very interesting uh, uh, way to conclude this uh, this conference. Uh, I just want to make some very did, uh, did I did I manage to close up the con the concert? Uh, very well, Dennis. Very well. Uh, <laughs> in a in a in a in a brilliant way and in a in, in an essential way. Uh, the, the the conference would have been extremely uh, wouldn't have been complete really without any form of discussion about the relationship between the USSR and today. So it was a really essential talk. I'm very I'm very glad. Um, it leads me to make some concluding remarks. This was uh, we believe the first academic conference in Western universities on the Today Party. It was certainly not perfect. It was held under very difficult situations uh, during during a global pandemic. Um, um, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, an attempt to bring together established uh, uh, figures in the field, the mentor of us all at the keynote, Erwanda Brahmian, followed by a wonderful uh, panel uh, discussion with him, uh, Turaj Atobaki, uh, Nasser Mohajer, Afshin, Stephanie Cronin, and then uh, all the other uh, panels which followed uh, until this concluding one with Peymon uh, Vaobzadeh, uh, Afshin again as chair, Kamran, uh, Dennis, they all really did uh, a wonderful work. I'm very grateful. Um, as the contributors know, the next step is to work towards an edited book uh, on the conference, which uh, hopefully will not be the first book in the uh, English academic uh, sphere to deal with the Tudor party. Uh, we hope that in the period between 
um, uh, the preparation of the book and its publication, there will be a, a, a book which will come out on the Tudor party. At the moment, that is, uh, that is not the case. So this is still a fringe topic in, uh, in modern and contemporary Iranian history. We hope we have moved things forward. I would like to conclude the conference by bringing uh, in the video uh, the, um, um, uh, the, um, our, our wonderful team uh, who, uh, here they are, have really uh, done an incredibly great work in the past few months to bring together, to handle the logistics of dealing with uh, time zones. And uh, um, we have Afshin and Paymon here who are connecting from Canada. We had Emily a couple of nights ago who was speaking at 2 or 3 a.m. from China. Uh, and anything in between, really. And uh, uh, once again, I'm extremely, extremely grateful to uh, Leonard, to Thomas. Uh, then, of course, last but not least, Evelyn, Claudia, Anya. They did a wonderful work over this period. And uh, my, my, my personal hope is that, uh, you know, uh, Claudia, Anya, Evelyn and Thomas follow Leonard down the rabbit hole of dedicating their uh, postgraduate work to the Tudor party, as he is doing right now with his uh, research work on, on the Tudor in East Germany. So uh, when uh, the time will come for uh, the Tudor at 90 or the Tudor at 100 conferences uh, in the not so distant future, we will be all the attendees and we'll be hearing them presenting their own research on this. So let's hope that uh, uh, one of the, um, one of the um, consequences of this conference is that both them and also the young scholars that we've managed to, to, uh, to bring together to this conference, that they, they have connected from Iran and we've managed to build this bridge to uh, this academic bridge, will continue the research uh, down this line. Uh, does anybody of the other organizers want to say something? Okay, well, if uh, nobody is uh, 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 nobody wants to take the mic, uh, all that's left for me to do is to uh, thank everybody once again and uh, thank the audience uh, for uh, having attended these various panels and uh, with the hope that uh, this research topic will re remain a live one and uh, we will see more research and, uh, and, and uh, a continuation of academic engagement on this topic in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.